Throughout history, some weapons have appeared and ruled the battlefield, sometimes for decades. The aircraft carrier, a supercharged mobile airbase, is one such weapon. For the last 80 years, it has served as the undeniable king of the open ocean. With dozens of planes on board, it also became a mighty platform to bring war to other countries. Opponents have, through history, tried many ways to counter it. So the question is, are the threats it faces today finally becoming too great? A message from Binkov's team first. We've thoroughly revamped our Patreon page, so we believe it now offers some serious additional value. Every patron, regardless of tier, will get access to our videos without any ads. Pure Binkov. Our second tier will also get access to a monthly poll, where our patrons will vote on several topics and pick the winning one, to be made into a Binkov's video. Anyway, if you want to check out what our Patreon offers, there's a link below this video, in the description section. The carrier usually allows several dozen planes to operate from it. Three Nimitz carriers could, for example, provide air power similar to that of the entire British Royal Air Force for a few months. Against most countries in the world, even just one such carrier would be a grave threat. And perhaps just half a dozen countries in the world could battle the entire US Navy carrier force over their own coastlines. Away from the ground-based aircraft in the open seas, the carriers are even mightier. Enemy ships could try and reach them, but would most likely be spotted by the carrier's scout aircraft from hundreds of miles away and intercepted. Without aerial recon of their own, surface ships and their weapons dating from the early 2000s could not do much. Anti-ship missiles were for decades touted in the news as the end of the aircraft carrier, but history showed us a different story. The Soviets did not have proper carriers, the US did. So the Soviet way of trying to deal with the threat was utilizing standoff attacks with missiles. That was the mid-1950s. Air-launched missiles also quickly added to the threat. But all of those missiles were basically small planes, slow, large and heavy, flying straight. And their range left a lot to be desired. Basically, the aircraft carrier could monitor the approaches with the radar-equipped early warning planes. Initially designed against low-flying bombers, newer warning planes had to include radars that could deal with smaller objects, such as missiles. Those missiles weren't that much of a different threat. By the mid-1950s, jet planes could approach at similar or even higher speeds, flying low-level, and drop bombs or fire short-ranged unguided rockets at ships. And the picket ships around the carrier could spot an approaching missile with their radars at decent distances. With missiles of that age being large, simple flying targets, the planes on patrol had decent chances of intercepting them. Anti-ship missiles, of course, got better over time. But so did the components of the aircraft carrier group and its systems. Missiles got faster, first reaching Mach 2, then in some instances over Mach 3. But defenses also got better, with even longer-ranged planes and better radars. So the time to react and intercept those missiles still remains somewhat similar. And electronics helped both sides. Missiles had better seekers and were performing evading maneuvers, while the defenses got computer-controlled and automated. The Aegis system is an example of that. During all that game of cat and mouse, the carrier did try to maintain one thing – range advantage over the missile so it could detect the platform carrying the missile and engage it before the missiles are actually fired. Submarines firing their long-range missiles were quite an issue there, as those could more easily sneak past the defenses and fire their lethal loads. To this day, one can't say with certainty if Soviet Oscar subs firing their granite missiles would have been able to sink multiple carriers. Today the missile threat continues. Missiles are getting even faster. The newest Russian Sirkon missile can allegedly do over Mach 9 using a high-altitude attack profile. That would perhaps mean around Mach 4 or so at low altitude. Low altitude approach is usually still better, as the defender's radar horizon against such targets is shorter, so the overall warning time is still less, despite the slower missile. On the other end of the spectrum, there is the proliferation of ballistic anti-ship missiles which don't care about low-level hiding and threaten the carrier via brute force. They're so fast, their range is so great, and their detachable warheads are fairly small that they can be hard to track during the mid-course flight stage. The defenses a carrier has are for the most part not optimized against such high-speed targets, 
which can swoop down towards the sea at over Mach 10. Classic defense systems like the ESSM are not very useful against such targets, as the interception would happen too late, when even just parts of the warhead after interception would be very damaging to the carrier. Interception of such missiles is preferably done at much higher altitudes, away from the carrier, which is why specialized expensive missiles such as SM-3 are used on US carriers. It's a game of chasing the cost in a way, as the anti-ship ballistic missiles also carry similar price tags, making them unaffordable in very large numbers. At some point the opponent may simply fire more missiles than the defender can hope to intercept. But would that be realistic for the attacker to have a fleet of vessels carrying dozens of such huge anti-ship missiles remains to be seen. Right now a missile with a thousand mile range requires either a land-based launcher or a medium-sized bomber as a launch platform. The Chinese are allegedly working on a smaller ballistic missile that can fit in their current destroyers, but such a missile is unlikely to reach much over 500 miles. Novel technologies like hypersonic glide warheads are basically a continuation of that threat, not necessarily a revolutionary concept that changes everything. They trade off some of the speed, compared to ballistic warheads of similar class, for added maneuverability, making them harder to hit, which again translates to more radars and more interceptor missiles needed to defend the carrier. But actually firing an anti-ship missile also means one knows where the carrier is. That has, through the decades, been very hard to do. Due to the range of the carrier's planes, the enemy can only guess the rough area where the carrier that launched them is, but they still need to pinpoint the carrier's location. That's done through a multitude of sources, with all of their data collected into a single picture of the battlefield. Submarines might hear the carrier and determine the rough heading, but not the distance. The ocean can sometimes carry sounds for hundreds of miles away though such noise propagation is not direct and is often imprecise. Several subs at once, listening from different directions, might give a better image, even allow for triangulation of a rough area. They would need time to communicate the data to the command. Aircraft are usually the best platforms to spot carriers, as they can be sent to a potentially dangerous area quickly, unlike submarines. They're also very good at giving out very precise tracking data, and can usually stay on station for long enough to give the missile in flight correction data. But aircraft are vulnerable, they can track surface ships from 250 or at best 350 miles away, depending on their flight altitude. Naturally, the carrier will have its own planes present in the air, and will attempt to intercept the enemy's planes as soon as possible, denying the enemy the opportunity to track the carrier, so the missile may not get that tracking data, even if fired very soon after the carrier is noticed or the carrier may not even get noticed if its combat air patrol happens to be positioned so much forward that the enemy's patrol plane doesn't even get to approach the area where the carrier might be. Another way to handle the uncertainty of the carrier's position is using loitering anti-ship missiles. Today they are smart enough to classify the contacts they pick up and recognize the carrier on their own. One such missile is the US LRASM. It's slow and subsonic, which gives it fairly long range. In theory, it can go to a few hundred miles out and then spend another half an hour searching for a potential target, using its advanced sensors. The US missile isn't really sized to combat defenses such as the US owned carriers, as it lacks range. Other countries might be developing similar but larger missiles, which might be able to go out to a thousand miles away from their firing point and then search for targets for an hour. All this is hypothetical so far as there are no indications either China or Russia do have such missiles, but those would certainly be within their technological capabilities in the decade to come. One of the emerging threats to the carrier today are satellites. Most countries in the world don't have the resources to upkeep a vast and capable recon satellite fleet, but two countries do. The US against other countries' carriers and China against US carriers. Back in the Cold War, the Soviets did try to use satellites not just for detection, but also for active tracking of carriers, via satellites equipped with radars, looking down from space. The idea was to passively listen to enemy radio emissions with other satellites, as well as submarines and other assets, and then use this information to locate the carrier, and then send a pair of satellites with radars, actually acquiring the carrier and tracking it and ultimately sending targeting data to other platforms in the chain, which were actually attacking the carrier. 
It was a sound idea, but the number of those satellites was never great, and only by the end of the Cold War was the radar tech advanced enough to surely pick up the carrier against the ocean background. The Soviet Union dissolved though, so for a few decades the US carriers were undisputed. And other countries either did not really use carriers or were politically aligned with the US. But China has been steadily building up its recon satellite force. A few years ago it managed to overtake the US in the number of active spy satellites. Of course not all satellites are there to look for carriers. But in theory any optical or radar imaging satellite of sufficient resolution can be used for that role. Optical satellites are sometimes a poor choice as they can't see through cloud cover. And there's always some clouds over the oceans. For example, Tokyo has overcast weather roughly 50% of the time throughout the year. But clouds move and gaps in the cloud cover do appear. And the carrier isn't that fast, so it might still be caught eventually, but not necessarily by the same satellite. Basically all the recon satellites orbit the Earth. Roughly once every 7 days they fly over the same area. But due to good sensors they can monitor the same area even when their orbit line goes just close to the area. So the actual revisit period over the area is sometimes just a few days. Still that means that to have updates of the situation over a single area every 60 minutes or so one needs possibly as many as 70 satellites. And while they could monitor multiple farther away areas while doing their rounds it's not likely they could monitor many close areas during the same pass. So to constantly monitor all of the western pacific for example, one might need 150 or 200 satellites. That's not something even the Chinese have today. But given how the satellite tech is progressing, it's not out of the question in the next 10 or so years. Today we're seeing the emergence of cheap small form satellites. They are sometimes being launched by the dozens, and constellations of dozens or hundreds are planned in the future. The following image is just one such example a commercial use satellite with synthetic aperture radar imaging. Some of these satellites don't even have ultra high resolution. If used for military purposes the resolution would not be there to identify the carrier, but to alert that there's something there. Another satellite can then be redirected to a special orbit to check out the contact. And if it is a carrier then a flock of those smaller sats can keep tracking it. As a side note. China also launched its first geostationary high-resolution optical recon satellite. Geostationary means it turns with the rotation of the Earth and sits over an area, staring down the whole time. For now it's mostly a demonstration program, good for meteorology. From such distances the said satellite still probably has issues identifying carrier-sized targets. But as the European Airbus group claimed, the technology to make such satellites of sufficient quality is very close. So who knows what will happen in the next 10 years in that regard. Even if one makes a satellite half as big as the one in the Airbus study, it would still be more than capable of identifying not just a carrier sized vessel, but also track destroyer sized contacts. But small satellite flocks are perhaps even more useful. Such flocks are likely to pose an even bigger threat to carriers than any single piece of missile technology. Of course, missiles would still be needed to actually go after the carrier. So the carrier might have to keep farther back, away from the enemy launch platforms. But it probably would not be able to outrun submarines. Sure, subs could ambush any ship and did so with carriers before. But conventional subs were slow and limited. They cannot actively seek and chase carriers. Through history they were weapons of ambush. Until nuke subs came into service in the late 1950s. Those could outrun carriers by enough of a margin that they became true hunter killers of the seas. But they are still fairly blind on their own. They need outside data to know where to look for the carrier. If they manage to find it, they can be deadly. Especially if several such subs gang up on a single carrier group. But subs are also quite expensive. Today only the US nuke sub fleet is plentiful enough to pose a constant threat to enemy carriers in open waters. But in a few decades Russian and Chinese sub fleets might increase in numbers. Not only posing a threat to US carriers, but also tying up much of the US submarine fleet for anti-submarine roles. One could argue that submarines have never been deadlier. While during the Cold War passive sonar was usually good enough to combat Soviet subs, nowadays passive detection seems to be lagging behind the quietness of new subs. The fact that the ambiental sea noise has increased several fold over the decades due to ever increasing shipping and industry doesn't help. 
decades ago, passive sonar could detect subs miles or tens of miles away via direct propagation of sound. Today those ranges dropped. Even indirect sound propagation, which usually carries sound much farther, can sometimes, and especially in shallow waters like in much of the East China Sea, be problematic. Carriers might be forced to stay away from shallow waters. And when the small satellite flocks do become ubiquitous, which is a decade or at most two decades away, submarines will be able to receive updates on carrier positions, and would spend much less time wandering around. They could be efficiently distributed around the ocean and efficiently used. Even a small force of say 12 nuke subs could in theory be a grave threat for the entire US carrier force. So not any one of the mentioned technologies would really put the nail in the carrier's coffin, but combined together they will greatly influence the way carriers are used. With carriers being harder to hide and being faced with more and more threats, they will have to keep farther and farther back. That will eventually impact the way the carriers are used compared to today. But more about that in our next video. Oh, and before you go, think about subscribing if you like my content. If you want to be notified of my upcoming videos, subscribing is not enough you also have to click that bell-shaped notification icon. And if you're viewing Binkov on a phone, notifications from YouTube also need to be turned on. Well, that's it for now. Salutations! And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.